Hey everybody, Jennifer Schaus here coming to you live from Washington, D.C. And thanks for joining us for our July session of the GovCon Q&A Cafe. Uh, these, are held, these are webinars that are held the second Friday of every month. Uh, they typically last about an hour and a half, and we've got four great experts coming to you uh, with various uh, diverse backgrounds that I think you guys will enjoy today. Uh, if you're looking for the recording, just use the registration link that you used, and that will take you there. Uh, instead, if you're looking for the PowerPoints, those should be up, I'll say at least by Saturday morning uh, on our slideshare.net site, the free site. Uh, here's some other topics that we covered for the first half of the year. Um, hard to believe that the year is halfway over. Uh, and the schedule for the rest of the year. Uh, next month we get into compliance and then we wrap up in December with mergers and acquisitions in federal contracting. Uh, just a quick blurb about us. Uh, we do provide services for federal contractors, including market analysis reports, proposal writing, compliance, uh, through to GSA schedule assistance. Uh, we've got a newsletter that goes out every Monday at 11 o'clock, uh, which is perhaps uh, how you learned about this webinar series. Uh, we do have advertising opportunities, um, and we do have some volume discounts uh, on the advertising uh, opportunities that are available. If you've got questions, just drop us an email at the hello at Jennifer Schaus. Uh, some upcoming events and special webinars that we're hosting. Uh, every Wednesday, we cover each part and we go sequentially through the DFARS, so the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulations. Uh, last year in 2020, we covered every part of the FAR. And then in 2022, uh, we're going to cover uh, the FAR supplements and there are 33 of those. Um, separate from that, what you see on your screen here, August 4th, which is a Wednesday at 11 o'clock, we're gonna cover FAR part 52, reps and certs. And then the following Wednesday, the corresponding DFARS part uh, 252, uh, reps and certs. Those are complimentary webinars, and I believe they are posted on our website. If not, you'll have the, the link in the slides uh, that you can grab off of SlideShare. Okay, now our sponsors. Uh, shout out and special thanks to the Virginia PTAC. Uh, this is the Procurement Technical Assistance Center. They are co-located at the George Mason uh, University over in Fairfax. Uh, they offer a variety of services, including uh, mentoring, training, counseling, matchmaking. They've got some online events. Um, so please contact them either at the email or the phone number that you see, uh, or just jump onto their, uh, their website that is listed here. They have all of their training classes uh, laid out in a, a very, I think, clear and concise uh, way. So thanks to the Virginia PTAC. They're a great group to work with. Uh, we also want to thank our other partner, Crown Castle. They're a provider of IT services, uh, and their contact information is listed here. Okay, so today we're going to talk about proposal writing. Uh, and as I mentioned, we've got four great speakers. Uh, Devin Hewitt out of uh, Pretoria Law. Her contact information is here. You'll see everyone's contact information again on the final slide. Uh, Lisa Shea Munn from the Pulse of Gov contracting. Uh, thanks for joining us. And also Anatalia uh, Masik from Lidos. And last but not least, Don Shannon, uh, the contract coach. So thanks to you for, uh, for taking the time to put together a great presentation that we're going to uh, dig into. So Devin, I think you're up first here. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, I don't know if you know, uh, my slides aren't advancing. Are yours? Ah, they're not. Okay. Um, so you're still seeing the first slide? Yeah. Hmm. Um, let me see here. I don't know if that's the case with the audience. I mean, I, I have my slides up on my other computer, so I can, oh, there you go. Can you see them now? Okay. Sorry for that. Let me see if I, okay. That's, that's my slide. Okay. Sorry about that. That's right. Okay, well, I'm a lawyer, so obviously when we talk about proposal writing, I see it from a legal perspective, and um, proposal writing matters from a legal perspective when? Well, when there's a protest. Um, you may say, well, it doesn't matter uh, if I win the contract. Well, uh, it does matter because if you win the contract, um, you could be protested, and that's when the language is tested or your writing is tested. So. 
uh, the, the points I'm going to make here are from my perspective being involved in over 200 protests over a 30-year uh, career. And yes, I was a child prodigy in government contracts. Um, anyway, so let's get going. Uh, this ought to be obvious. Um, you're writing a proposal to a solicitation. So in order to write a proposal that's compliant, and one that is going to be advantageous for the government and be evaluated well, you have to understand what the proposal wants and what the evaluation factors are seeking. So if there are any ambiguities or um, if the proposal is confusing, um, it should be obvious that you need to seek clarification. What I often find with clients, though, is they like to game the system, or they think they're gaming the system. They think they know what the agency wants, really, if they aren't saying it. And if they don't ask the question, maybe they'll get an advantage because the other bidders don't know. And if they ask the question, they'll reveal their competitive advantage. Or why ask the question because the government really is not going to answer it, or the other people are going to know it's them, and they're all this, you know, overthinking about it. Where there's this legal doctrine called patent versus latent ambiguity. And the doctrine is if something is obviously ambiguous and you don't ask about it, then the government can make whatever interpretation it wants out of it, and you're stuck with it. If you asked, haven't asked about it, you're stuck with it. And it may surprise you that their interpretation is, in fact, not in your favor, after all. Now, if it's something that is not really uncertain until after the evaluation, and then one looks back on it and it says, oh, yeah, that wasn't really clear, well, the GAO or a protest authority will say, well, we'll look at what's really reasonable in interpreting it. So the point is, if you don't ask the question, you're going to be stuck with it. Um, so ask the question. Um, it's only going to hurt you if you don't. And if the government doesn't ask it or doesn't answer it, ask it again. And if they don't ask for, answer it, ask it again. Keep asking, because if the government doesn't answer, then that's in your favor. So just keep asking and asking and asking and, you know, when in doubt, ask. Don't not ask because somehow that's going to help you. Ain't going to help. Another, you know, what should be obvious, what seems minor can be major. It's in the wrong spot, ah, you're out. It's too many pages, ah, you're out. You, you have gotten uh, caught in somebody's firewall, ah, you're out. You're out, you're out, you're out. You know, that is the easiest thing for the agency to do. They have these strict rules. They seem stupid. I cannot tell you how many protests I have written, my eyes rolling as I write it, because the client says, oh, my God, that can't be the case. You know, I just missed it by one second. Or it got caught in somebody's spam filter. Or, you know, I just didn't redact that thing. Um, they can, you know, just write the protest. That's ridiculous. No, no, no. They don't care. That's the easiest thing. They mean what they say, and they say what they mean. So, um, you know, go through your proposal with a fine tooth comb. They aren't going to waive those certain things. You ain't that special. So, little things, um, little things matter. All right. Another thing that really comes up, and sometimes isn't your fault, but you know, causes a lot of hand wringing is this concept of bait and switch. You propose key personnel, and then suddenly what happens? The people leave, um, they get hit by trucks. No, they don't really, but they could be hit by trucks, so you sort of have to think about it. Um, uh, and suddenly they're not available. Well, the unavailability of key personnel is always an important material requirement. So you can't just say, I don't know, I don't see it, don't tell me, I don't know that they don't, they're not there. Um, if you have actual knowledge that the person you've proposed as a key person is not going to be able to perform the duties, won't be there to perform the work, you have a duty to inform the agency. You have to tell the agency. And I'm sorry to say, yes, it's true. 
that if you, you inform them and they don't like it, you can be eliminated from the procurement. That sucks, totally sucks. Um, or they can conduct the discussions and allow you to substitute another candidate. But remember, if they do that, they have to do that with everybody. And that's very tedious, particularly if they didn't um, didn't intend to do that in the first place. So, you know, that that you know, that's a house of cards. You know, your key person leaves and that could ruin everything. Um, now, if you didn't, you know, if you don't know that person's left, and sometimes you get a commitment letter and you put it in, and suddenly the person, you know, has decided to run away and elope in Mexico and he didn't tell you, that's fine. You know, how are you supposed to know? Um, you know I mean, you're good. Uh, so what can you do if you have this ceiling, this guy's a little flaky, you're not so sure. You know, a lot of um, offerors um, often pay uh, retention bonuses, you know, wouldn't hurt to drop an extra Twinkie on the desk as you walk by you know, every once in a while, it all helps. Um, but once you know, you're screwed. So, you know, keep that in mind. Nothing's going to save you that. All right, next slide. Ostensible subcontractor rule. Now, this applies for small businesses, but I can't tell you how, mu how much this trips people up. Um, I think people hear about this rule, but they don't really know what it means. If a small business is has a large business as a subcontractor, particularly if that business was uh, previously the incumbent, was small and then grew out and suddenly decided to find another small business to be the prime and now it's the sub. If the, the new prime small business um, is using the incumbent now subcontractors personnel to perform the primary and vital duties of the prime contract, that um, relationship is going to violate something called the ostensible subcontractor rule. And the rule simply is, hey, you're not really doing this work. You're, the subcontractor is using you as a front. And you're not really a small business because all that money is really going to the subcontractor. And therefore, you're going to be out. This is the main um, basis for most of the small business size protests that we see. And it's tricky. You know, um, there's a lot of flavors and variations of this. I've done so many protests on it. You know, um, what about hiring en masse of the you know incumbent personnel? If you say you're going to target the incumbents, is that the same thing as making a commitment to hire the incumbents? Does it matter that you only hire key personnel? Does it matter that you hire the key technical personnel, but not the management personnel. I mean, there are ways around it. You know, the I mean, that's why I exist, right? I mean, that's my value add. But the problem is a lot of people don't think about it at all. Um, and then, you know, uh, you end up with this proposal that neatly fits into the textbook, ooh, ostensible subcontractor, and then you're done. So that's, you know, that's something you need to think of ahead of time and often, um, the SBA will look as far back as the teaming agreement to see if this was a setup to begin with. You know, they're all very excited. You know, it's this big conspiracy to defraud. So uh, again, you need to be thinking ahead about how you're going to write the proposal, how you're going to present it, so you don't end up in this ostensible subcontractor situation. Next slide. Finally, again, it's something that may not be at the top of everybody, everybody's mind, but anytime you submit something to the government, you're making a statement, which is subject, by the way, to criminal prosecution. There is a criminal statute saying that if you make a false statement to the government, it is you are criminally liable to that false statement. Well, I mean, I don't think the government's going to come after you for criminal prosecution if you say you're going to provide them you know, with five gigabytes of something, and oh my God, it's four. No, they're not too concerned about that. However, if you say you're going to provide a key person, and you know that key person's not there, and you provide this other key person, you know, okay, maybe they're not going to come after you for that. But reps and certs, oh yeah, that's really important. So, and some of them aren't that easy to understand, by the way. Um, so, you know, if you're on the edge there, get a lawyer to look at it. 
But more importantly, in the small business set-aside context, those are very dangerous because a new law was passed not too long ago that says, we don't care what you think. We don't care if you're making an honest mistake because we think the moment you check that box, you're liable. No matter what you thought, no matter what you looked at, no matter who you talked to, if you're wrong, we can come after you. So that means, you know, with regard to what you say your size is, with regard to say what your status is, um, and keep in mind that, you know, deciding what size you are ain't that easy. You know, when do you count back? What do you count? At what time do you decide that you are small? Um, now, status isn't that hard. I mean, you're disabled or you're not, but if you're a hub zone, that ain't so easy. Um, and then you've got, at what time? Are you supposed to figure out if you're small at the time of the contract or at the time of the task order? Well, I could tell you, I could give you a whole webinar on that because that is not that easy either. I mean, thank God, otherwise I wouldn't be able to buy my designer shoes if this were all you know, very difficult. And then new regulations of when you need to recertify. Um, if it turns out now you have submitted a proposal and then you are involved in a transaction, a merger or a sale of assets, et cetera. Um, and that's within 100 days and before award, you have to recertify and tell the um, contracting officer that you know, you've gone through this. And you, you are other than small after that recertification, you're not eligible for that award. So you know that's something you ought to think about. However, if the government's been dragging its feet, and the acquisition occurs after 180 days and there hasn't been a ward, you're still entitled to it. But I tell you, this is a new, I mean, you heard it here first, That's this is a, a new rule. And um, I still get calls from people saying, yeah, I heard there's a new rule. So um, yeah, 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 these things are changing all the time. So I hope you go back to your, your uh, colleagues and say, who knew? But I heard this from Jennifer Shass's webinar. Thanks, that's it. Thank you so much, Devin. That was too funny, uh, <laughs> cracking up the whole time. And it is bringing us really nicely into this next section that we're gonna be discussing, which is developing your proposal outlines and templates. So hi, everybody. My name is Lisa Shea Munt. I'm the co-founder of the Pulse of GovCon. We're a boutique market intelligence firm that specializes in developing business for government contractors. I myself have 11 years of experience as proposal management um, and have worked on over 200 individual proposal efforts with over, I believe, $10 billion in wins in that time. So I'm very familiar in the proposal space and absolutely love it. Now, with all of those credentials, something that I want to say is me and your other proposal managers and especially your proposal writers are not lawyers. You know, we might play one on TV when it comes to this acquisition process. But Devin, so many things that you said absolutely resonated with me because a lot of our role is to try to alleviate those protests, to protest proof the proposal in the ways that make sense from a proposal management's perspective. This is the reason why I, for one, never touch the reps and certs. And people have asked, and I've seen a lot of debate on that on LinkedIn, where people are like, the proposal manager was responsible for filling out the reps and certs. And we said, whoa, buddy, no, we are responsible for making sure you know you have to fill it out, but absolutely make sure that you get your contracts department involved um, or your lawyer and especially executive management. So a way that you can protest proof your proposal if there is such a thing is right in the very beginning. So I'm gonna be talking a lot about just the logistics of developing outlines and templates and why they are important. A lot of people skip this step and it's a shame because if you are to engage in a proposal effort and set up your outline and your templates in advance, then you can save yourself a lot of the headaches when you submit these proposals. Um, so outlines, what are they? There's a couple different types that you can look into. There's a summary outline, an annotated outline, and a compliance matrix, which is technically an outline. I, for the purposes of this presentation, am going to encourage every single person to, for every single proposal, put together an annotated outline writer's template before you start writing. 
And there's a lot of reasons for that. It's because it helps you organize the solicitation requirements. And that's not just the PWS requirements. It's not just the technical material, the capabilities that you have to write to. That's those other elements that Devin was talking about, like your font size and type. And so you can make sure that you're maintaining accurate page count. You know, we had a situation recently where a proposal person's um, headers and footers were the wrong size and they got dinged for that. It's those things that should be set up right away in the outline. But it's not just about setting up the writer's template as it stands. You have to leverage these tools in order to keep your writer focused on what needs to be developed over the course of the proposal effort. So it's not just about shredding the solicitation, it's also about providing guidance for your writers. It's pulling out the L, the M, the C, any of the other requirements as laid out in the solicitation, but then it's going a step further and it's breaking out what understanding, approach, experience, those are typical um, ways to outline, right? We've all seen them, it's not rocket science. It's pulling out your place for your wind themes. It's letting a area for a tagline or that sort of hot button area and, um, and subject matter that you are able to present in a, um, a designated way. And it saves you time when it comes to checking your compliance requirements. So next slide, we can talk through kind of how to, how to work that. So I already mentioned the three types of outlines, and right now we're talking about the annotated outline or the writer's template. So something that we at The Pulse like to say is that outlines are driven by L, threaded by M, and informed by C. And we like to think of creating a proposal outline almost like a paint by numbers exercise. So when you are developing your outline, please, for the love of all that is good in the world, start with L. There is something so frustrating about somebody that wants to write a proposal thinking that they know what the government actually wants to see. Devin, you also said that and it very much resonated. How many times have we worked with someone that said, no, no, I know my customer and my customer loves me and they really want to see this. Well, you can't be evaluated against something that you think somebody wants to see. And also how well do any of us know anybody in our lives, let alone our customer? So make sure that you start with L. You'll see a lot of people, and people have argued with me about this, we'll start with C or the PWS or the SOW because they say this is the technical subject matter. That's all well and good, but typically in M, the evaluation criteria, it will say that they are being evaluated based on your ability to follow instructions as laid out in L. So it seems a little counterintuitive because some people also say, well, if they're going to be evaluated by M, why wouldn't I just outline by M? Well, it's just because of that, because it points back to the instructions. And then C is threaded through the proposal to show your capabilities. Sometimes, and this one hurts people, sometimes the solicitation won't even ask you to address the PWS or the SAL in your proposal response. And technical folks lose their minds over this. They said, well, the PWS exists. And yes, the PWS does exist. It tells you what you're going to have to work towards. That's what the statement of work is. But if it's not being evaluated, if it's not being asked for, then it by very nature should not be a part of your outline. And so you certainly shouldn't start with that. Outlines, the reason that I'm harping on them so hard right now is because as a proposal manager, this can be one of the most contentious parts of the process. We have been in full blown out fights, arguments, punches thrown, not punches thrown, over outlines and what people believe should be presented and how the proposal should be organized. And what it comes down to in developing your annotated outline and your writer's template is it's never as obvious as you think because reading and writing and communication and language just in general is unfortunately really subjective. I was talking about this with somebody earlier today. The fascinating things about proposal writing just in general is we've taken something that is naturally subjective, but we need to objectively evaluate it with color ratings or number ratings. But what we're really doing is taking language as we can um, interpret it and have to turn that around in a way where somebody is able to score it. So that's why so many people get hung up on the outlines and why there are so many disagreements, because what you read versus what I read could be something completely different. We could interpret it completely differently. So the outline process, 
should start with your proposal manager. It should be the person that is responsible for ensuring compliance. They should write the outline, but then it should be agreed on by committee because you shouldn't be getting past pink team into red or gold and changing the outline of your proposal. You are going to give yourself such a headache if you end up doing that. Compliance elements are going to be missed. You might end up changing some of the bracketed references from the solicitation. You know, that L.2.4 reference might end up moving and become L.2.5. Um, so making sure that everybody is on board on how to present the material in a way that is compliant first and compelling second. Yes, I said that. Compliant first, compelling second. So I want my proposal to be compliant and compelling, compliant and compelling. Yes, we all do, absolutely. But especially from a proposal management standpoint, making sure that it is compliant is our number one goal. And the way that you can do that is by setting up the foundation of your house before you start building it. Because if you start messing with that foundation, it will crumble. There's a lot of ways to set up these outlines as well. I actually, I did a presentation. If you go to the Pulse's YouTube page, we have uh, an hour long video and presentation where my business partner, Amber and I actively shred a real solicitation. And we show you how wonky it can be. We show you how you pull pieces apart and you combine requirements where appropriate and how there are those discrepancies. And now Devin might say, if you see a discrepancy or you see something that's not adding up, that's a question first and foremost, absolutely. And you keep asking that question, agreed, but we all know that sometimes the government's answers to those questions is just see solicitation or no, <laughs> and they don't give us much. So at some point you're gonna have to figure out you know, what components get combined, which ones get pulled apart, and how to make sure that somebody on the source evaluation board is able to evaluate your proposal effectively. And so we could talk about outlines all day, but that is all I have for now. So thank you very much. Oh, this is gonna feed nice into Anatalia's. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. You set me up really well. Um, so yeah, annotated outlines, that is a must. Um, but first I'll say, I'm Anatalia. Thank you guys for having me. Um, I am the uh, BMP uh, Director for Lidos's Security Detection and Automation Division. Um, I've been dedicated to proposals for 12 years of my career, but I started out as a writer um, and have maybe like 15 years of experience there. Um, and so writing, even though I've never had a proposal writer uh, writing title, writing is like near and dear to my heart and the proposal writers are always my, my favorite people on the team. Um, so I love talking about this stuff. Um, so yeah, annotated outlines, we have to do that. We have to be compliant above uh, being uh, compelling that we need to be compelling too. So it's kind of like, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna focus on compliance, right? So the best way to start, just so that we set a, a baseline for everybody, because um, we're saying a, a lot of things, and so let's be tactical, right? That's where my ma mind always goes, is okay, like how do, how do we actually do this, right? Um, let's not start from a blank page. So first thing is clear writing. We have to be clear. Um, being clear is being simple, concise, have easy to read language, because that's the easiest way to determine that we are compliant. Um, I know, like uh, Lisa was just saying, the RFPs could be so incredibly complex and confusing, they contradict each other. So the best way to counteract that is in our proposal writing to be as clear and as simple as possible. If we have sentences that are really only just a few words, that's okay. It's okay to have short, simple, concise sentences so that we can clearly establish what we're saying and what we're trying to get across, um, because that's going to make it easier for our evaluators to score us. Uh, basically, we don't want to do to the evaluator what they're doing to us, right? We want to make it simpler. Uh, compliant writing follows the instructions, like Lisa was saying about that section L that must be what we use to guide the outline and to guide our writing. We have to start with the instructions first because that ensures that our bid will be evaluated. Nothing else matters. We have to align to the instructions first. Um, then the evaluation criteria gets layered on top of that. And then the SAO, if that's included as well in the evaluation criteria, that just, that just has to be the way that it goes. Um, 
so first instructions, then evaluation criteria, then the then the SAL or PWS or whatever it is that they're referring to. And then next is responsive writing. So again, we're kind of we're kind of saying a lot of the same things here. Um, so uh, so bear with us in that in that repetition. But uh, the responsive writing answers the question. So talking about you know we know our customer, we know that they're actually looking for this thing. Um, but that might may or may not be what's written in the solicitation, right? So we want to again answer the instructions, talk to the evaluation criteria and then delve deeper, then be responsive to whatever else it is that the, the evaluators who actually may or may not be um, the people that our BD and sales team members have been talking to, right? The people evaluating the solicitation may not be the people who wrote the solicitation, may not be the customers that our BD team is talking to. So we have to consider all of those different aspects as we're writing our actual proposal. And so th there's a lot, a lot to juggle there. So if we're if we're being clear in our language, simple, concise, we're focusing on the actual instructions first, then the evaluation criteria, then the cell, and then being responsive to the answers that those deeper answers, those deeper questions, um, <laughs> then we'll win, right? <laughs> Hopefully, maybe that's the goal. But we have to layer it. We have to layer it um, to get the fuller picture and to hopefully um, answer the fuller questions that the customer is looking for and to be as successful as we possibly can be. Next slide. All right, so getting started, we don't want to start from a blank page. Um, we want to start with that annotated outline, as we mentioned. Um, so whether you're the proposal manager or the writer, that annotated outline is going to be your best friend. I do recommend, um, so Lisa mentioned having the compliance matrix or the summary outline or the annotated outline. I don't, I don't think it's an either or. I think you start with a compliance matrix, and that feeds into and becomes your annotated outline. Uh, but every proposal manager is a little different. and then to depending on the complexity of the opportunity, the amount of time that you have. Um, someone said to me once um, during an interview, uh, yeah, we have quick turns. They're usually like four weeks. And I was like, four weeks is a luxury. <laughs> So depending on the amount of time you have, you might you know, fluctuate on, on how you do it. But for me, typically, you do the compliance matrix first, and that feeds into your outline um, and becomes your annotated outline. And that's what's going to be sort of uh, where you start from so that you don't have a blank page. But at the same time, you're not just regurgitating the solicitation language, right? Because then we're not really being uh, responsive. We're just giving them back what they've stated, and we're not building out the who, what, when, why, where, how which is how we really show our value and how we're going to win the work. Um, and that's really a good way to take that solicitation language, even like if it's a bullet list underneath it, and saying who, what, why, when, where, how. So who's going to actually do this work, whatever that requirement is, right? Maybe it's, you know, build a test plan um, for whatever software or whatever it is that you're developing, right? Who's going to build the test plan? When are they going to do it within the project timeline? How are they going to do it? What's the step-by-step -step process of how they're going to do it? Um, why are they going to do it that way? Um, where? Is there a specific, you know, location that it has to be done? Does it have to be done on-site? Can it be done in a hybrid sort of location? Think through all of those details um, and jot them down. The first, you know, going into pink review, maybe it is just a couple of like quick answers. And then um, if you're a writer or a SME, you know, the level of detail in those answers may be different. So work with your SMEs if you're the writer to get the additional details and, uh, you know, it, it might fluctuate right um, first level is is very high level um, or sorry first draft is very high level not a lot of detail as you work with this means you'll get additional detail and go through um, and provide more fidelity through each review you want to use your compliance reviewers. Um, so I know sometimes it feels like, ah, compliance, no. <laughs> I don't want to send it to the compliance reviewers. They're going to send it back to me. Everything's going to be wrong. I'm going to have so much work to do. They don't appreciate all the time and effort that I put into it. I understand. Um, whenever I send a document out to a, a compliance reviewer, it's like they're your best friend and your mortal enemy at the same time. Um, I've actually hired Lisa as a consultant to do compliance reviews for me. And it's like, oh, I love you and I hate you at the same time. <laughs> Because you want that feedback. You want to know what you're missing. Um, because if you're not compliant, then 
everything's for naught um, because your bid can be thrown out before it's even actually evaluated um, or on something, some tiny little technicality. Um, like Devin was saying earlier, the small things matter. They really, really do. And that is the most heartbreaking thing to get thrown out on is a small technicality. So you have to appreciate and sort of embrace, <laughs> embrace the compliance review or embrace that process um, because um, without it, you know, all of the hard work that you do put in um, all becomes for naught. And then ask questions if you're not sure. So a lot of times if you're the writer or proposal manager and you're working with a technical SME, the way that they review and understand the solicitation language might be different than you do. Um, they might take a lot of things for granted that they're reading, especially in the SAO, um, and they might understand it in a different way than you do. So if they're writing things in there and it seems like it's compliant, but you're not 100% sure, ask the question, always ask the question. I probably irritate the heck out of everybody that I work with because I'm constantly asking questions. Are you sure that that's right? I'm not so sure. That doesn't seem like it's the same thing. It's okay because we'll never uh, get to where we need to go if we're not clarifying and verifying information, right? Um, so make sure that everybody's on the same page and we all have the same information in front of us um, so that it is fully compliant and we're all clear that we are fully compliant. Um, because the worst thing that could happen is they think that they have it, the SME thinks that they have it um, completely compliant, and really it's it's a misunderstanding between the language in the solicitation and what the SME is thinking of, and there you have it, our bid's thrown out because we accidentally missed something that we thought we had. All right, next slide. Reviews, review, review, review. <laughs> So always review your own content first when you're a writer or even the proposal manager. Um, when I was a proposal manager, I would never send anything out for a content uh, pink, red, gold review before reviewing it myself first. And yes, that does take a lot of time, but it was really critical for me to go through all of the content first and make sure um, that I had an understanding of what we were putting out, especially in front of our executive reviewers, um, before, before sending it out. Um, and if you're a writer too, before sending it to the proposal manager, or any of the other team members, review it yourself first for compliance to make sure that to your level of understanding, it's compliant. Um, and again, embrace the compliance reviews. Try to have more than one compliance review done. Again, I know timelines can be really difficult, um, and especially if it's a complex or a very strategic opportunity for your company, it's maybe very high value um, or any other factors are there, consider having more than one compliance reviewer. I've done that too, where maybe we'll have have um, one person on our internal team or we'll hire multiple uh, consultants to do compliance reviews as well, um, especially if it's like a high value, uh, like some of these GWACs that are coming out, um, I will hire multiple compliance reviewers to come in and do the compliance reviews just to make sure we're not missing anything because some of them can be very, very complicated. And again, missing one tiny little thing could be very, very critical. And then use the color review process to make sure that you understand the end goal um, or and understand the end goal, which is basically we're all working together. Um, the whole team is there to make sure that we're all putting together the content. It's not reliant on one writer or one proposal manager. There are a number of people, SMEs, um, contracts people, pricing people, everybody's working together to pull together the content, the proposal response, um, and to make sure that we're getting a compliant and compelling and winning bid out the door. So we have to use the processes that are in place. And if there aren't processes in place, then you know maybe advocate for that within within your uh, company to help ensure that we can get there um, to make those to make those proposal processes a little bit better for you. Um, and if they're not happening, ask for earlier executive reviews and feedbacks, um, especially if you find that they're coming in later, because that's something that will also help ensure that you're getting the compliance and the, um, the feedback that you need earlier in the process. Because again, that's the only way that you're going to get the, the content to where it needs to be so that you can have that compliant, compelling response um, that gets submitted in a timely manner and is going to win, win your company the bid that you need. And I think that is my last slide. So thank you guys for your time. Well, thanks. Uh, my name is Don Shannon. And I run a small business called The Contract Coach. Uh, I do uh, consulting work for proposals and government contracts. Uh, Self-employed. Uh, I have had the, my own business now for the last 13 years. 
uh, I've been doing proposals for over 30 years. Uh, started with Martin Marietta, Boeing, uh, and some of the larger defense contractors before uh, going into business for myself. My average or typical proposal is something on the order of a three month effort uh, and the dollar value on the contracts that I'm typically associated with are over 100 million. Um, I'm going to approach this from the standpoint of the contracting officer. Um, I am a, a CFCM, that's a certified federal contracts manager, and a CPC, I'm certified professional contracts manager. And I have worked uh, as a, a government 1102, uh, which is contracting officer. So I'm going to put on the contracting officer's hat and come at this from their perspective, although most of my experience is on the writing and proposal management side. But I'll give you a kind of a, a counter view. So the first thing I'm going to tell you is make your proposal easy for me to evaluate. If I have to go on an Easter egg hunt to find out if you know what color chip to paint the piece of equipment that you're going to provide me, I'm not going to be a happy camper. So you, you need to, to make it easy for me. So how do you do that? Well, first off, you align your proposal and your, uh, your solution to the solicitation. I know so many people uh, on the marketing side who want to take a, an off-the-shelf solution and rewrap it in new paper, put a little lipstick on it, and sell it to you uh, and say that that meets your, your requirements. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to take the easy way out. They're trying to force that square peg into a round hole. So the first thing that I'm going to tell you, your solution should be aligned to my solicitation requirements. You should be addressing what I'm asking for and giving me what I want, not what you want to give me. Okay. Second thing, when we ask questions or give you areas that we wish you to address in a solicitation, we want you to answer that question. We want you to answer it directly, clearly, and to the point. I'm going to skip a bullet here for a second, and I'm going to tell you, don't filibuster. Now, those of you who are familiar with politics know what a filibuster is. Uh, those of you who read LinkedIn quite a bit probably saw the filibuster contest on proposal writing here about two weeks ago, where somebody said the proposal or the solicitation requires the respondent to operate a washing machine. And then people took liberty to write out, uh, we have 30 years experience of operating and maintaining washing machines and are total experts in how to do this and, and blah, 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 blah. And the answer went on and on and on. Okay, that's a filibuster. If I have to, to read your proposal, you're one of quite a few proposals that I'm evaluating, first of all. And I don't have time to waste. And so if you start putting in these long, wordy uh, answers that don't directly answer the question that I'm asking you, I may not give you full points. I may get tired of reading and go on to something else. Okay. Um, acronyms. Oh, my God. Uh, I'm doing a lot of stuff right now with cybersecurity uh, because that's a contract requirement and a proposal requirement. And there are a lot of people that are asking, well, gee, how do I meet this requirement? Well, if you want to put yourself to sleep, go read NIST Special Publication 800-171, which are the cybersecurity standards uh, for what they call CMMC, and you will fall asleep almost instantly. Okay, it's horrible. We've had a little talk about a compliance matrix, and I'm going to tell you that first and foremost, that is the best inoculation to having a non-compliant uh, proposal. In other words, if you use a requirements matrix and you document the solicitation says 
in section C.1.2.3 that the, the solution must be painted yellow using Sherwin-Williams uh, color chip XYZ123, then you should be putting that information into your proposal, the technical volume. And you should cross-reference that back to this matrix. I put the answer to that question in my proposal at paragraph 1.2.4. And putting that in the back of the proposal volume is not a bad thing. Why? Because number one, it makes it easy for me to give you the maximum score because I can find your answers to the questions that have been asked. Okay, write for your audience. There are people from, I call them marketing department, uh, who want to use a very flowery language, who want to who deal in hyperbole. And that makes it sound good if you're a marketing person. But I'm not a marketing person. I'm an agent. I work for the person who's going to receive and use whatever products you're offering me. I have to determine whether or not your offered solution meets those requirements. I don't care about uh, cutting edge technology. I don't care about uh, blockchain. What I care about is have you directly answered my requirement and are you giving me what I asked? Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this has been talked about by everybody, <laughs> and I'm going to talk about it again. Submit a compliant proposal. Why? Okay, Devin, it, sometimes winning is just not losing. <laughs> In other words, I can't give you a winning proposal each and every time. I can give you a very competitive proposal. I can give you the best product I can give you, but I can't guarantee that it's going to win. But I can guarantee you that if I don't give you a compliant proposal, it's going to lose. Okay, so sometimes winning means not losing. I mean, if there's only three offers and two of those offers haven't complied with all of the requirements, in the solicitation and you have now now we've got the field down haven't we okay so l and m are going to tell you the l is going to tell you the administrative requirements for your proposal and if i tell you that it's a 20 page limit then i stop reading at page 20. i do not go to page 21. and if you Whatever score I've given you at page 20 is the score you're going to get. End of story. Okay. Uh, make sure you've included all the attachments and additional information that's required by the solicitation. This is especially true. You've all been talking about the technical proposal. I'm going to talk about the cost proposal because I also do cost and pricing. And if they want you to follow FAR 15, uh, table two and submit in contractor format, but they want you to basically provide all the information that's in the FAR at that location, and you don't do it, then you're not compliant. You, and that'll, that'll send you home, folks. Uh, don't send me on an Easter egg hunt looking for information. Uh, use paragraph headings and titles to identify key information. Um, Lisa talked about an outline, okay? And so typically the proposals I've worked on, we've used a numbering strategy of the A.1.1 or 1.1.1 or, or something similar to that. But that should be in your outline or in your template. That should be a heading one a heading two, 
a heading three uh, kind of format. And you should have following that a brief descriptor of what's in that section. I should be able to go to the table of contents. And if I'm looking for uh, logistics uh, deliverable items, and I'm concerned about uh, the parts provisioning data, I should be able to go to that table of contents and find the section that deals with parts provisioning data and go right to it. Um, don't make me look, okay? Make it self-explanatory. Give me, you know, guideposts and a roadmap. Um, the easier you make it for me, the to find the information, the easier it is for me to check off the stuff on my evaluation check sheet and find, you know, give you a good score. So uh, make it easy. Okay, submit in a timely manner. Uh, as Kevin said, if you're late, you're done, you're going home. <laughs> so don't be late, not one second. Uh, be early, early is good. Uh, next slide, please. Details, details, details. Okay, I think this kind of goes to Lisa's point about doing the reviews and uh, Anatalia's point about doing reviews. Make sure you do a thorough quality check prior to submittal. Um, first of all, you wanna do an editorial review of it. Um, someone needs to go through their, through the entire document, look for consistent voice, uh, make, sure that it sounds like it was written by one person instead of uh, a group of people. Um, make sure that the grammar and spelling is correct. You don't want to, to misspell uh, the, um, the department's name. You don't want to include or, or uh, put the wrong name for the client, uh, things like that. Uh, compliance. This is the compliance matrix uh, at work. Every requirement in the contract or in the solicitation should have been pulled out when you shredded that document. And every one of those requirements should have a paragraph number next to it that tells you where you answered that question. Now, it's up to the subject matter experts to then look at the answer and say, yes, I believe this answer uh, is technically correct and that we've answered the mail. But it's terribly important that you do that compliance review. And then finally, the what I call the administrative or white glove uh, review. We're pretty well past the days of sending in uh, binders with uh, hard copies of proposals. Although the last one I did for $300 million, uh, we had to send in an original and three copies. Uh, and it was, you know, six, 800 pages of documentation. So good size proposal. And so what do we do? If I've got an original and three copies, I've got four people. We go into uh, a conference room, we put the book on the table, and we go through it page by page by page. We look for things like smudges, smears. Um, did it go get messed up going through the copy machine or, or what have you? And it's the so-called white glove test. And when you're done with that, the books get closed up. You, you've got a, a little check quality checklist. Uh, you look down there and say, okay, do I have a CD-ROM with the electronic version on it? Yes. Is the CD-ROM labeled correctly? Da, 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 da. Uh, do we have the right headers and footers and, the, and so on and so forth? Fine. And off the door it goes. Okay. If it's possible, use a pricing tool to create pricing data uh, in preference to using an Excel worksheet. Um, full disclosure, I'm a uh, consulting partner to a company called ProPricer that makes a, a very good product for generating cost or pricing information or data. Um, and it has several advantages. The one advantage that I like is that it's consistent 
and that it doesn't make formula errors because there have been many times uh, Excel spreadsheets have had little formula errors in them that have caused uh, a great deal of embarrassment at the least or disqualifying you at the, at the worst, okay? Scrutinize every piece of art in the document. Make sure it aligns with the proposal text. Watch out for marketing's favorite infographic that only they can understand. Um, I'm being hard on the marketing people, but sometimes they, they're very abstract thinkers. And so they will put in a document that's at a very high level and very abstract. And they will assume that everybody gets the point of that, that infographic. Not so. Okay. Um, finally, I'm hungry. So when I sit down at the table, I want to eat meat and potatoes and stick to your ribs food. Good old carbohydrates. Uh, I don't want hot cuisine. I don't, <laughs> I don't want canapes. I don't want appetizers. I want a steak and potatoes. So feed me. I'm hungry. Jennifer, back to you. Great, Don. Thanks. Uh, and thanks, uh, Devin, uh, Lisa, and Natalia for great content. Uh, for all of the folks on the line, uh, any questions that you have, please go ahead and type them into the control panel, which should be on your right-hand side. And there's a section, it's maybe the third from the bottom that says questions. Uh, we're now going to dig into uh, some questions that uh, we'll hopefully reiterate some of the information that our panelists presented. So, Devin, we'll start with you, and I'm going to uh, run through these. Uh, can an agency's disqualification of an offer for a minor proposal error be grounds for a winning protest? And I think you might be muted. Uh, the answer is no. I think we uh, addressed that earlier. Um, there, you know, there is a um, there is a FAR clause that uh, does allow a contracting officer to waive quote unquote minor informalities, um, but that's generally in bids, uh, not in proposals. You know, when they do sealed biddings and they open up, you know, in public all the pricing, um, you know, if there's a decimal point or something that's obvious, they can waive that. But in negotiated procurements, no. We, I mean, we've said this over and over, you know, if the font's wrong, if um, the page count's wrong. Um, when somebody was talking earlier, I had a like an LSD flashback of a protest I did, and, and I kid you not, that about whether or not a, um, a proposal was with, within the page limit. And I can't remember what side I was on, but all I know is that we ended up printing this proposal on one computer, but we had to send it to another computer at another site because it was printing a different page length there. And then we sent it to another computer at another, and I was like, oh my God, seriously? But I mean, that's how, you know, how, how it gets in our protest. You know I mean? We literally down to, is there a word that goes on the other page? So, uh, no, no. The answer is no. Uh, if you're if that that word's on the other page, they ain't gonna read it. Gotcha. Great. Go ahead, John. Uh, let me give you the CEO's perspective on that. Um, we have something that's called clarification, and I can use clarification to resolve questions or minor ambiguities. So. I may not reject your proposal if, if there's a minor informality or, or, or something wrong in it. Uh, I, may, I may seek clarification from you on that. But once the contracting officer has made the decision to reject the proposal, and that's where Devin comes in with the protest, the contracting officer has kind of thrown down the gauntlet and they're going to stand by that decision uh, but up until the point where they make that decision there is some wiggle room for discussion or possibly uh, resolving that minor informality but once the die is cast the die is cast and clarification simply means 
if you, you know, if you have a decimal point that may not be in the right place, the contracting officer can say, did you mean a hundred thousand? You didn't really mean a million, did you? That's a clarification. But if the contracting officer calls and says, you've got a paragraph that went the other page, and the offeror says, well, can I shrink it to one page and give you a new page? They can't do that. Anytime you substitute something in your proposal, it's no longer clarifications. It now becomes discussions, and it means the contracting officer had to open it up to all the bidders. Yep. Great. Okay. Thank you. And we'll move to our next question. Uh, over to you, Lisa, for this one. Uh, how can I get my technical uh, SMEs to write our proposals? I'm gonna get a lot of hate from this one, so bear with me. The answer in short is that you don't, you shouldn't, and you can't. Okay, wait, hold on. I know, hold on. <laughs> Not in the way that you want them to. That's what I'm getting at. What I mean is there's so many people that say, I wanna get my SMEs to write the proposal. And so they'll give them a blank Word document in the solicitation, and they will say, go forth and write. And that just, does not work you will not cannot won't get those SMEs to write a proposal in a way that you are happy with in a way that is compliant it's why you need technical writers it's why you need proposal managers it's why you need the proposal people in this otherwise you would just get your project people to write your proposals number one it's hard enough already because these SMEs are already on projects and so that means that most things that they do happen to be nights and weekends number two a lot of them if they're working a more technical field tend to be more of that left brain than right brain in terms of writing. You know, a lot of them are engineers because they didn't want to write. They didn't like English. <laughs> and now you're forcing them into something that they don't want to do. So that's hard. Um, and number three, it's difficult to explain to somebody the idiosyncrasies of what proposal writing needs to be if that's not their profession. So old school would say that you interview your SMEs. You would either get with them in person and they would dictate and somebody else would write it down and then massage that writing into something else. People don't have time for that anymore. Everybody is doing more with less. If you can actually get your SME in the middle of an eight hour work day to sit down with you for two hours, then God bless you, they don't have enough work. It's um, something that is really falling by the wayside. So my answer, and I won't spend too much time on this, but the way that you get your SMEs to write is not only by using things like your annotated outline, but to build out that annotated outline using response-based forms for your SMEs to enter data into and not writing. So this is, if it says, part of the solicitation says that you need to provide your process for meeting these milestones, these deliverables, then you cannot just say, give me a process. You need to give a table that says, what are the five steps that you take in order to make this happen? Subject matter experts tend to be too close to the material that they work with already, and so they don't see what a process is. They say, I just do. I do the work. That, you know, I get up every day, I put my pants on one leg at a time, and then I do the work. And so you have to break it out so you give them tangible, digestible pieces by which to answer that writing in data, and then you take it and turn it into proposal writing. So nobody hurt me. <laughs> I'm all about uh, flexibility. I think sometimes we need different responses for different proposals, different teams. Um, so within my department, we do have writers that are dedicated to developing the content, and some of them will interview our SMEs. I guess I'm a little old school in that way. Um, we'll take the time to interview our SMEs, but we'll also do the annotated outlines. Um, we haven't done the forms. I think that's a good idea. And so maybe we'll start um, looking at something like that as well, sending them the data calls. Uh, basically um, to do that for some things but having them yeah sending them just a blank sheet of paper that's a bad idea no matter what so we don't do that um, but we will we will send them the annotated outline when we don't have a lot of time and it's like guys we need you to kind of pull it together for us here's the annotated outline please give us back your responses or our writers will just develop the content based on existing materials that we have and ask them to give us feedback during the content review process as well. Um, so we kind of take a hybrid approach depending on the opportunity. But yeah, we don't want our SMEs writing really. <laughs> Great, okay, and we'll move to our next uh, question. Uh, we'll stick with you here, Anatalia. Uh, what's the difference between responsive and, uh, hang on, I've lost part of my screen, uh, compliant writing, sorry about that. 
Yeah, so this is this is something that I think people get confused with a lot. Um, uh, they frequently throw in compliant when they mean responsive, because as I think we talked about a lot throughout this uh, panel, the compliance is really talking to the instructions first and then the evaluation criteria, um, and then our SOW if it's a part of the instructions and evaluation criteria, right? Um, so that responsiveness comes in and how we talk to the additional sort of unspoken answers and how much detail we provide um, to the uh, uh, sort of unspoken questions for the SAL, um, any hot buttons that are there, um, spoken or unspoken, because sometimes the hot buttons are written into the solicitation, um, cri or, uh, solicitation requirements as well. Um, so that's sort of where the responsive comes in and that's the extra bit um, but the compliance is the sort of hard and fast that has to be there all the time we have to be compliant we want to be responsive and we should always try to be responsive but we have to be compliant in all things okay and our next slide uh, Don we're gonna uh, hop over to you for this one uh, if I wanted to do uh, one thing to improve my proposal score, what would that be? That would be to make it easy for the evaluator, as I said earlier, uh, provide a very well organized and laid out response. Try to match the organization of your proposal to the organization of the solicitation, especially the statement of work. Uh, address information topically where you can and use those paragraph headers uh, to create an outline that leads the reader to uh, the right place and then when you write your response make it clear make it succinct and make it answer the question don't give me a whole bunch of superfluous uh, material just give me what I ask for uh, and answer the question. That's it. Great, thank you. Uh, and what proposal mistakes cause contract awardees to lose protest against the contract award most often? Devin? Well, I, I wanna say one thing which actually nobody's really touched on. Um, and I think it's worth saying, having uh, you know, looked at, been in so many protests and looked at so many proposals and more importantly, seen the protest and proposal process, you know, starting 30 years ago and over time. First of all, most proposals are very well done. Um, now, I participate in protests, you know, when you're starting maybe at 20 million and obviously go up to the billions, but even at the lower end, it's remarkable how many pro how many proposals look very similar. They're of high quality. Um, you know, on occasion, you know, they they do um, have the wrong text or they you know don't get where they're going. But for the most part, they're almost always compliant with those sort of things. Um, they're almost in the same formats and they almost have the same headings. Um, I mean, they're well done. Um, and back in the day, you know, among the lawyers, uh, we used to joke that we would, you could tell how good a proposal was about how how much the binders weighed or what the binders looked like on the outside. I mean, you know, these little inside lawyer protest jokes. But, um, but nowadays, you know, there is very little difference. Proposals are very well done. And there is a uniformity in how I think companies now approach them how they write them, um, they're just very professional. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know if this is good news or bad news, but um, there often are little things that, um, very little that, that offerors who know what they're doing, and like I said, most companies nowadays do, to really improve their proposals. I mean, everybody includes the compliance matrix. Everybody includes the abbreviations. Most people don't pair it. I mean, people know what they're doing. Come on. Um, for the most part, I'm not, you know, proposals aren't thrown out because of that. More importantly, the government's gotten smart, right? They make the evaluation criteria so ridiculous, you know, high confidence, or it's blue or red. and. If you look at the criteria, they're so vague. You know, the government has high confidence that you're going to do it. They have some confidence. And then, you know, it's so subjective. 
So, I mean, we're talking, it's hard now. I mean, it's really hard. It's so subjective. So, um, you know, I, I, when I tell people, you know, what did we do wrong? I mean, okay, if it's the wrong font, you know, shame on you. But really, there's very little that in the end of the day is going to make a huge difference. I mean, and I don't know if that's good news or bad news. I think it's because all the proposal people that, you know, they use, people like Natalia and Lisa, you're doing a great job. If they didn't have you, then they'd be in trouble. But unfortunately, you know, Linus, your competitors are doing the same thing. GDIT and Northrop Grumman, they're hiring the same people. So when you go in, you know, price, you know, obviously is a big issue. And sometimes it's the people you propose. And we all know how expensive those people are. And there aren't many of them. And so I'm not telling anybody anything new. But what I'm saying is, um, you know, it's tough out there. One thing I have noticed, and it's very, probably the most interesting thing to me that I've noticed that other people have said um, is this. And that is that, um, that the proposal people here don't count on the SMEs to write their proposals. And I will tell you, that ain't the case in all these protests because, uh, I cannot tell you, this is the thing that drives me the most crazy when I'm in a protest. Because yes, I can say it's subjective and yes, you can't do very much, but suddenly there's a protest, right? And the awardee's telling me, oh, there's nothing to it, there's nothing to it. I'm like, great, here we go. I'm gonna get paid, I'm gonna go off with my pina colada. This will be so easy. And, and I'm not talking like it's a small company from, you know, doesn't know what we're doing. I'm talking it's a big company, they know what they're doing. So suddenly I'm writing away, and, you know, there's some issue and I call the technical people, you know, I'm not technical, I can barely operate my phone. But, um, so I get on the phone with them and I'm like, oh, gobbly good this and gobbly good that, you've got this, so, you know, explain to me how this goes. And of course the in-house lawyer is no help, he has no idea either. So finally he goes, oh, let me get my SMEs on the line. And so the SMEs are on the line and they're trying to explain things. And I'm like, well, what about this? So what about that arrow? And you know, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm just reading what you said. And every single time, every single time, they don't have an idea. They have no idea what they're saying. I'm asking them simple questions like, what does that dot mean? Well, uh, and they say something, I'm like, but that's not where the dot is going. You know, and, and they're like, well, that was somebody else's response. And I go, well, did that person look at this graphic? And suddenly, you know, what seemed to be clear to everybody and, and who they assured me they were compliant, I'm like, but that dot is not going where you said it's going. And they're like, well, that's not. I go, they're going to look at that dot. That dot is going to make the difference. Now, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but it makes me crazy. It makes me crazy where somebody has not asked or looked at what the SME has said. And maybe it's not the proposal writer, maybe it's another SME, or you know, maybe the SMEs ought to get together and criticize each other's work because they may know not that, but they may know, hey, that dot's what I'm doing and you got the wrong dot. You know, because that is where it all falls apart. It's, you know, I can work with everything else, you know, but when it gets to those technical things, what happens is the SMEs thinks, well, they know what I'm talking about, or, uh, you know, I'll just say it in general terms. And, you know, they, they sort of think that nobody's gonna catch it. Or, and I'm not saying they're doing it intentionally, you know, or maybe they don't really know, right? And they're stirring it. But anyway, Ultimately, it's like the emperor's clothes. You know, I'm the little guy going, wait a minute, why did you look naked to me? And suddenly, you know, it's embarrassment all around and people are running and oh, I'll get that ass of me and oh my God. And, you know, meanwhile, I'm eating donuts. You know, I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. You know, 10 pounds later, you know, we lose the protest. So there you go. Okay, good stuff, thank you. Uh, and Lisa, why is it, uh, why is proper desktop publishing an important part of the proposal writing process? You're muted. Yeah, you're muted. There we go, I think. Am I back? Yes. Okay, I was like, I should, my thing was great. Uh, so one of the things that we see, especially at small companies is 
the separation of desktop publishing and writing. And I know that for a long time, and especially in highly siloed organizations, these are different activities. I believe, I am a firm believer that your proposal writers and proposal managers should be at least the littlest bit learned in desktop publishing, because I think it is such a critical component of maintaining proposal compliance. And it's something that was largely ignored, I, I believe, for this hyper old school. Um, by that, by desktop publishing, I mean a simple understanding of how to use styles, making sure that you understand spacing between lines and paragraphs, making sure you can set headings and your headers and footers to the right size and components. Understanding that when you are developing graphics for your writing that you have to work within those size standards as well. And that if you have different margins, like you need a one inch margin all the way around, then that means that your graphic on a regular portrait size piece of paper can only be 6.5 inches across. And same with your tables. It's this sort of desktop publishing understanding that is going to help you in setting up your writer's template. It's going to make sure that you're not making a complete mess of the document when you're integrating other people's work and writing. You have to know to you know, right click and copy as plain text and not bring in other formats so that things don't become an absolute mess at the end of it. So I believe it is a really important part of the writing process because unless you know what the final product is going to, or have a semblance of what the final product is going to look like all the while, you could get to the end when you turn this over and realize that you're four or five pages over. How often has that happened? Or that you're non-compliant in some of these other elements and it pushes the page count um, or different sections. You know, there's some requirements of a writer to maintain different page allocations within sections. So understanding what a section header is versus a, you know, a page break. Um, these are all really important elements to writing. So if you have writers, and, and a lot of times you'll also depend on your proposal manager to have this understanding when they're doing a combination of the, um, the, the documents or the people's inputs or when adjudicating comments for a color team review, but it makes the whole process go a heck of a lot more smoothly if your writers have you know, this innate understanding of what it means to set up a document and the design and why it's important. It will also help you in your review process. There are so many wasted review remarks and comments in color teams where it's like, well, I can't read this. It's like, all right, you can't read this. It's an online submission. It's a document. You can magnify it. It needs to be eight point because we're page constrained. Move on. That should not have been a comment of yours. Um, and, and all of that, or people say, oh, I don't like the optics of this, or I don't understand why the graphic um, came before it was introduced and it's because all of a sudden you were up against a section break and you needed to otherwise everything would move you know what it's like to move an image in word you kind of move it a slight thing and then everything goes like that and then everything bounces and jumps and moves and so it's just become with the aesthetics being more and more important in proposals so that people like Devin will see it and be like look how elevated everyone's proposals are you know it's not just a wall of text. There's a lot of things like hot boxes, call out boxes, tables, and graphics. And none of them are, you know, it's like florals in the spring, right? Oh, groundbreaking. Nobody's saying these are new things. These are expected components of proposal writing. And so you should have an understanding of how they impact your document. Super, thanks. So we've got about 12 minutes left. We still have uh, two quick questions to get through here, hopefully with some short answers that we can then jump over to the audience questions. So, uh, Anatali, over to you for a uh, last question to you for how can a poorly written proposal impact compliance? Yes, um, so I'll keep it really short. I think um, I talked to this and even Don a little bit, as we were saying, if it's hard to understand what is written in your proposal, if it's poorly written, if the English is very complex um, and difficult to understand, they won't be able to evaluate it clearly and so you won't get the points you won't get the score that you need even if in fact you have written the response you have written to the requirements it's hard to find you won't get the points so you'll be deemed non-compliant and you'll uh risk losing the bid uh, yep yeah. what's the one big mistake i see my clients make Correct. They want to jump into the proposal and start writing before they have even defined what their solution to the requirements 
are going to be or is going to be. Um, they want to recycle information from the last six proposals, cobble it together, put a Band-Aid on it, and throw it across the transom. So that, that's a big no-no. Uh, Lisa, uh, I just have to make one comment to you. You haven't lived till you've got an 800-page document and someone comes in on the weekend and does a copy paste from an old proposal uh, of about a four or five page section into the middle of your document and clobbers every one of your styles and formats. That's right. fine. Okay. <laughs> so now we're, we're going to take these uh, quick audience questions. Uh, first one should be a quick answer here. Uh, where do we find the outline? Wait, what? Where do we find it? Right. Where do we find it? We make it. We build it. It's our, it's our brains. Correct. Okay. But sometimes Section L will have a recommended outline, but if they don't, uh you can follow the general layout of the statement of work uh, as a guide yep typically right. the proposal manager and our coordinator will work together to come up with what the outline needs to be and they should be working with your sales and bd team or your capture manager to determine the flow and and what the outline needs to look like great uh and any advice on unsolicited proposal development especially if you are familiar with the agency and the sort of solutions they are looking for i would always short. start with them oh, <laughs> yeah keep it short <laughs> uh, i would say first things first about unsolicited proposals go read far part 35. okay because that's pretty much the, the answer to your question. Unsolicited proposals, everyone seems to think that they're, you know, uh, a way to get, get your foot in the door and to sell something. By and large, that's not the case. Um, so FAR Part 35 has a pretty good comprehensive answer. Right, and we covered uh, all parts of the FAR in 2020. So if you go to our website, navigate to the FAR tab, and then they're listed there chronologically, just uh, scroll down and click on the recording. It's complimentary. Uh, next question says, how do you handle answers that are required in different areas? Answers that are Yeah. So like duplicative content throughout the proposal, like they ask for something, a bunch of the let's same. Assume, yeah, yeah, let's assume that. Um, unfortunately, I, you know, if you're allowed to cross-reference, cross-reference. If you're not, then you just have to be repetitive uh, just to cover, you know, it's a CYA. Great. Uh, as a small business, is there a pricing tool that would be accessible to us without having to spend money for it? Is there a pricing one? Tool. Tool. All right. Okay. Um, I would suggest that they uh, get my email address off of uh, this slide and contact me directly and I'll I'll provide them with a direct answer. Great. It depends on what you mean by tool too. So, I mean, if you're talking about something that's gonna spit out the pricing for you, then no, but there's other resources like GSA Calc has things like contract awarded labor categories and hours and there, there's resources out there that you can leverage for free. You know, when we talk about tools, uh, Lisa, we're, we're typically talking about um, those software uh, products that you use to calculate the overall cost and pricing data. Right. And okay. So thanks. We're going to keep moving on here. What is your advice on simplifying a technical proposal when the SME writes the technical approach that is too technical and not easy for the evaluators to understand? There's a principle called the flesh Kincaid test where it, they've studied that proposal should be written at a fifth grade reading level, and that's not to disparage anybody that reads it. So that's been really helpful on some SMEs to set it up, you know, act like you're explaining this to a fifth grader. Sometimes just that psychologically can help them to simplify. Great. Uh, I just started an entry level proposal support position. What are some of the best ways I can be an asset to my team of colleagues who nearly all have 20 plus years of experience? Pick up the low-hanging fruit. Offer to yeah, do things like acronym lists, 
or if you don't have you know a tool that automatically does that um, do the compliance matrix the the sort of administrative tasks are extremely helpful great okay if an organization has no formal proposal writing process what are resources we can use to see examples of the steps in a proposal writing process to get them started with the de uh, with designing their own hey, you're looking at them right uh, there's so many <laughs> people out there there's so many consultancies there are so many people that put out resources you know i'm not going to pump my own sauce but everybody's got something out there linkedin's a great place to look people put out those kind of processes all the time exactly uh are there any online resources you can recommend to proposal writing beginners yes i think they're the same <laughs> right and so have you even talked about apmp at all i haven't yeah i was like ah oh, should i should i bring it up um apmp is the association of proposal management professionals so i highly recommend um, checking that out especially if you're new to proposal management um, they have the Bach book of knowledge which has a ton of uh, templates and guides and resources when i was starting out in proposal management that was like my go-to i actually still have a binder in my office somewhere with like printed copies of like tons of things um just on you know guidance of how to do proposals, right? Um, so I highly recommend, you know, checking out their website, uh, become a member if, if it suits you. Um, I also have a couple of articles on, on LinkedIn as well that talk about sort of my journey and, you know, tools that I've used and tricks and, you know, things that I would recommend um, to get started, communication styles, things like that to help sort of uh, advance in your career in proposal management and, and how to do the things. Um, and of course, you know, reach out to myself and everybody else on the panel as well and, and network um, is really the best, best thing to do. Exactly. Uh, and yeah, I was going to say, we also have some webinars, I think at least 50 plus out there on proposal writing, all complimentary. Um, so any last uh, words of wisdom, advice? I know, Anatalia, we may have an incorrect phone number listed for you up here. I apologize for that. Uh, so if uh, anyone on the line has any additional questions or thoughts for any of the panelists, you can contact them all here at I probably the safest bet is probably email uh, since we know those are correct. Um, next month we are covering uh, compliance. Uh, September I think then is oral proposals. October is set asides. Uh, November is pricing. December is mergers and acquisitions. And then I think all of the panelists mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation today, uh, reps and certs. We are doing two special webinars on those. August 4th at 11 a.m., uh, the FAR portion of reps and certs, and then August 11th at 11 a.m., uh, the DFARS portion. Uh, the links will be are in the, the slides that unfortunately were not being shared at the time. I apologize for that. Uh, I want to thank the panelists for a fantastic job. This was a lively, fun conversation. I learned a little bit. Um, enjoy the interaction amongst you guys and appreciate you guys taking the time to put together content, sharing your knowledge, your expertise, uh, and time on a, a beautiful Friday afternoon. I want to thank the attendees for joining us as well. Uh, like I said, we'll send out the link to the PowerPoint slides and send the recording to anybody uh, that participated today. So thanks everybody for joining us and thanks again to all the panelists. We'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.